This is the uh, Iran-Israel nuclear crisis simulation. It's a follow-on to the uh, Indo-Pakistan uh, nuclear war uh, simulation. The purpose of the simulation is to show nuclear weapons in the context of an international balance of power uh, situation. In a rivalry between Israel and Iran, which involves both uh, nuclear weapons and access to oil issues, there's a significant follow-on effect for states that are outside of the region. And so the purpose of the simulation is to show that in a multipolar environment, uh, resolving uh, a nuclear crisis or uh, engaging in a nuclear conflict with another state uh, occur under a relatively more complicated uh, circumstances than, than are frequently associated with, say, a large uh, nuclear exchange between the superpowers. In this particular simulation, Iran begins with a random number of nuclear weapons between 1 and 10, which are then assigned to different assets. And then the simulation uh, begins operationally with Israel being given an opportunity to strike Iranian targets. The first time the Israelis attack, they can fly over uh, uh, Turkey or Saudi Arabia, and uh, those uh, hosting states don't suffer any penalties uh, because it's assumed that the Israelis uh, were able to conduct the operation with surprise and uh, not necessarily with the support of those two states. So let's elaborate on the uh, simulation. Typically, uh, for a seminar class, these are the different positions. Uh, as with all of the uh, simulations um, uh, in which there's a, a multipolar number of states that I uh, apply in my classes, the political authority is isolated from uh, other uh, state leaders and can only interact with other state leaders through their foreign ministers. And so the foreign ministers interact with each other and the uh, foreign minister and the executive are not permitted to see the map uh, in which the military operations uh, take place. And so the military uh, individual gets their instructions from the political leader and then have to implement it. Uh, the same with the foreign minister and then the executive based upon the strategy they chose, has to balance the uh, foreign ministry and the military as instruments of whatever strategy or foreign policy they chose. Each of these assigned uh, positions has a mission card which details the victory points they get and lose for certain actions and for certain outcomes uh, in the international system. Uh, or uh, tactically uh, for the uh, military leaders or uh, economically uh, and related to international relations for the foreign ministers. So you can see here in the simulation, Iran, the U.S., Israel, the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, essentially Saudi Arabia plus Oman and Kuwait and, and the other Gulf states, uh, NATO uh, representing the, the European states, Russia, China, and Japan uh, each have uh, different roles. Uh, Russia, China, and Japan, of course, uh, one individual uh, has all of the different positions. And for NATO and the GCC, the political leader is also the, uh, the foreign minister, uh, in effect. Uh, positions can increase if the class is larger and can be decreased if the class is smaller, although this here really is the minimum number of personnel to run the simulation. This is the map of the simulation. The train is uh, similar to the Indo-Pakistan simulation that uh, students can refer to. Uh, blue is ocean, uh, blue hexides are rivers, uh, green are... Um, uh, uh, fertile uh, terrestrial uh, areas. Each hex is, is about 30 kilometers. Uh, each turn in this simulation is three days. Uh, the yellow is a uh, desert. Uh, circles with a dot in the middle are cities. Red lines are international frontiers. Inverted Vs are uh, mountains. Teardrops with red inside are oil facilities. Red circles with a green inset are uh, nuclear research facilities. A red circle with two parallel lines on the inside are TABs, or tactical air bases, which are the, uh, the military air bases inside Iran. Uh, the Straits of Hormuz has uh, dashed hexides uh, to identify the crucial part of the Straits of Hormuz that must be cleared for the flow of oil. And southern Iran has a, has a, a dashed line, south of which uh, ground units may deploy and north of which ground units may not deploy. So it basically indicates the operational uh, parts of Iran. In uh, central South Saudi Arabia is a black triangle, uh, which indicates uh, the location of Saudi Arabia's uh, missile base. And um, uh, those are the essential uh, terrain features um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the map. 
This is the uh, uh, values on the unit counters. The, again, it's identical to the Indopox simulation. So going uh, clockwise from the bottom left, you have anti-air values, anti-ground values, anti-ship, and then anti-submarine uh, values. These are the counters. Again, not a lot of pieces. You've got the Iranians um, uh, represented, the U.S., NATO, uh, Israel. At the bottom left are nuclear markers, destroyed markers, and sea mine markers. Uh, among the Iranian units in green on the left, at the very bottom, you can see a one white piece, which is the Iranian satellite that hangs over uh, Israel. There's three activation markers, one for Hamas, Hezbollah, and Syria each. Uh, in the center are the orange markers, which are the SAM uh, surface air missile uh, units from both uh, the uh, Russian Federation and uh, China. Then there are two columns on the right-hand side, which are the reinforcements. The first column on the left is the conflict reinforcements. If there's any conflict anywhere on the map, these units become available to the U.S. player if they're willing to pay for them. And the right side reinforcements are for the, strait, for the closure of the Straits of Hormuz and the uh, impact this has on the, uh, the world economy. And so you've got the Chinese, the Japanese, the NATO, and, and Pakistan, as well as the Americans that intervene to that effect. The bottom of the uh, counters list shows the uh, meaning of the symbols used on the counters. Uh, some of them are, are uh, uh, ships, um, some of these are, are ground vessels. Aircraft are, are depicted by a silhouette of an aircraft. Uh, these are the setups. Essentially the Iranians set up first. They have to uh, put one of their aircraft each at a tab, a tactical airbase, but all other countries can deploy a maximum of one air unit at a city. There are no, no air, air bases outside of Iran. In Iran, it, the air, air units may only base at tabs, and they may be a maximum one aircraft per tab. Uh, then the Iranians deploy their uh, SAM sites. They have two missile units, the Shahab-3 and the CSS-8. Those go to two designated uh, specific hexes. Uh, the ground units are deployed south of the dashed line in southern Iran, along with the IRGC uh, and the Navy. Uh, the GCC sets up after, followed by Israel, uh, then NATO, uh, which sets up the two Turkish aircraft. Then the Americans set up their naval craft uh, in the Arabian Sea, and uh, three of their um, uh, PACs, their Patriot Air Defense System, somewhere in the GCC. Uh, China will eventually deploy later on, as well as the Russians. Uh, they, during the course of the game, uh, can offer uh, Iran uh, surface to air missile systems. And these can be deployed initially uh, if there is a, a pre-game arrangement between Iran uh, and the Chinese or the Russians. This is a, a map with an overlay of the um, illumination areas. Uh, Israeli aircraft, when they fly from Israel uh, to Iran, if they overfly uh, any hex that's within two hexes of, of Syria or over a city, then they're illuminated, and uh, in, in effect, uh, the Iranians are warned the Israelis are coming, and the, the uh, Iranians have a plus one modifier to their air combat and to their surface-to-air missile operations. Now, the uh, Israeli F-16 and F-15, the ranges of those aircraft, are indicated uh, in blue and maroon uh, in the center of the screen. Now, if the Israelis um, uh, don't get permission after their first air assault, uh, to overfly uh, Turkey uh, or Saudi Arabia, then they um, uh, uh, suffer a loss of their tankers because the large Israeli uh, refueling tankers, which give the added range to the F-16 and F-15, are vulnerable and certainly couldn't operate anywhere near uh, Syria's uh, surf air missile systems. So uh, the Israelis can overfly Jordan, um, they can overfly uh, Iraq, although there's a risk of activating the population there, uh, and that's uh, discussed in the rules. Uh, and if they overfly Saudi Arabia and Turkey, they may be intercepted if they can't get the cooperation of the Saudis or the Turks. If the Saudis and Turks give their cooperation after the first Israeli surprise air attack, then tankers can be used, and it significantly ex extends the uh, range of Israeli aircraft. When the Israelis uh, overfly um, after the first uh, violation, um, there are there are no victory point uh, losses to uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, but subsequently uh, it would be expected that the Turks and the Saudis would not allow the Israelis to overfly their territory. Now the leaders of Saudi Arabia and Turkey may waive that, they may permit the tankers to overfly, but then they suffer negative penalties. There's a minus two uh, penalty for every turn which Israeli aircraft overfly, for example, Saudi Arabia. 
minus one or, or minus zero if the Israelis have a level two or level three permission. Level two permission assumes the Israelis uh, create a Palestinian state. In other words, Israel uh, has uh, uh, created a less hostile environment for itself. Level three, which is uh, very costly to, for Israel in victory points, is to allow, uh, allow the right of return for the uh, Palestinians, and it's very unlikely the Israelis would, would choose that. But it's just to show the range of uh, the intersection of Israeli air actions and their policies on the ground with regard to the Palestinians, and the, how that affects the regional reaction to the Israelis taking action. Now, the Israeli target list uh, uh, is primarily the core uh, infrastructure of the Iranian nuclear weapons complex. Here we've got Kandab, Kumarak, Natanz, and Esfahan. They've got hex, hexes indicated. The modifiers are to the air-to-ground um, strength of attacking aircraft. Um, for those characteristics, you can refer to the Indo-Pakistan uh, simulation to look at how those numbers work. And then there are uh, values there and victory points uh, that reward the Israelis or the Americans or the Saudis or anyone else that uh, hits the uh, Iranian targets. Um, many of the targets around Tehran are associated with the core complex and with the secondary complex. Any red circle with a green inset is a uh, nuclear weapons research facility. Around Tehran, there are quite a few. Some of them form a part of the core complex, and uh, others form um, a, a part of, a, of an extended uh, 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 context. You can see a lot of air bases located around Tehran as well. So here we have a typical uh, air operation. It's imagined here that the Israelis flew over Turkey with tanker support with Turkish permission and were not intercepted by the Turks, and they had managed already to engage and uh, clear out uh, Iranian uh, interceptor aircraft. Now, the essential rule is Iranian aircraft can intercept within three hexes within Iran against any aircraft that enters their territory, illuminated or not. Uh, here you can see in the center uh, orange and green air defense units, which look like hats. The SA-11 is Russian, and the Hawk is American, and they operate in the one hex where the, where the counter is located. The S-300, however, operates uh, in the six hexes around that central hex. So the Israelis also have, if you look at the top of the, uh, uh, the image here, a special forces unit, which is sort of a, a very faded, heavily used um, ground unit. Uh, they can do many missions. One of them is to do a LERP, a long-range recce patrol, where uh, in, they go to the location of the uh, target and then they use laser designators to facilitate um, the high-accuracy impact of the ordnance dropped by the Israeli aircraft. There's no chance of the unit getting destroyed in this, and they provide a plus two. So it increases the ground effect of the aircraft by a plus two when they try to damage the, uh, the target. So in this scenario, we've got the uh, Iranian aircraft that come up to uh, fight the Israeli aircraft. And the Israeli aircraft will continue to their target unless they're damaged or, or destroyed. So you have three uh, Iranian aircraft. They engage the three Israeli aircraft. They're all using their air, air combat uh, capabilities. Um, and uh, in this particular instance, uh, all three Iranian aircraft are damaged. One Israeli unit's damaged and has to abort and return to Israel. The other two units continue on to their target, which they then have to face the um, S-300, uh, which can reach into the adjacent hex and the Hawk uh, surface-to-air missile system, and they shoot at the uh, Israeli aircraft. In that instance, another Israeli aircraft is damaged. The remaining Israeli aircraft then strikes the target with the uh, help of the Special Forces unit, um, uh, possibly damaging the Iranian uh, facility. So these are the uh, other facilities. You can see some of the modifiers on these are pluses because they're uh, essentially easy to hit open targets like the uh, light water reactor of Boucher, uh, which is a high value and it's not uh, directly associated with um, Iran's uh, nuclear weapons complex. Uh, the Israelis or, or the Saudis or the Americans or the European Union uh, may strike at uh, the oil infrastructure in Iran instead because some of it's uh, closer uh, easier to hit, much larger. Uh, there are more positive modifiers or fewer negative modifiers. And the value of the damage uh, is specified in the rules according to thousands of barrels per day of infrastructure damaged. So uh, there's a fair bit of slack in the Iranian system, and so you'd, you'd have to destroy a, a fair bit of the uh, refineries before you hit the a significant increase in victory point losses to the uh, Iranians. Now, Israel also has targets that can be struck. The Iranians have conventional missiles as well as nuclear missiles, potentially, uh, that could strike at Israeli targets. Um, if Ramat David is struck, the rules specify uh, consequences for damage to aircraft there. If it's uh, a single uh, conventional missile that hits the base, then one F-16 is lost. 
And if a nuclear weapon goes off, it's a 1D10 or a 10-sided die. I typically use a random function calculator to generate a number between 1 and 10, and that many F-16s are uh, no longer functional. Damona is the Israeli reactor and requires two hits of a conventional weapon or one hit from a nuclear weapon uh, to uh, decommission the site. And parts of it are underground, so you have the minus two uh, modifier. Uh, there are also, also oil facilities in the GCC as well as at uh, Al uh, Sulayil, the uh, Saudi missile base, which has the uh, Chinese Chinese missiles they purchased from the 1980s, uh, which is important because they can be matched with Pakistani warheads. In the reinforcement phase, uh, if uh, the Straits of Hormuz are closed or if Saudi Arabia is struck by Israeli or Iranian nuclear weapons, they can call and bomb the Pakistanis who will weaponize uh, two of the missiles at that base. So this is the uh, consolidated uh, reinforcement chart. Uh, it basically follows um, the uh, counter sheet that you saw earlier. Uh, the point here, the difference between this and the Indo-Pakistan simulation is here, there are optional reinforcements where the Americans would be charged a victory point for each unit. Not all the units are charged. Uh, special forces are free. Uh, most of the naval craft are free. Um, but many of the heavier ground units and some of the heavier air force units and naval air units uh, must be paid for. And so there's a cost to, opportunity costs, to uh, focusing on the uh, Middle East. Uh, now, if the Straits of Hormuz are closed, and that is to say someone declares that they're closed, and the Straits of Hormuz would probably be closed by the Iranians in retaliation for uh, the international community doing nothing to put pressure on Israel while Israel is striking at Iranian targets. So it's a form of um, demonstrating escalation dominance. And the uh, Iranians could do this with mining, um, with their navy, uh, with silkworms, uh, which are anti-ship missiles based on islands like Kish in the Straits of Hormuz with marines. Uh, if they were to close the straits down, then there are penalties for a great many actors, including the Chinese, the Japanese, uh, the Europeans. And so there's pressure on the U.S. then to do something and open up the straits. And plus the Americans in general um, uh, have an interest in the well-being of the international economy because of their liberal trading ideology. And so they would react negatively to seeing a closure of the straits even temporarily. Uh, and there are severe penalties if by the end of the simulation, uh, the straits are still not open. So here's the uh, Straits of Hormuz. You can see the dashed hex sides, which indicate the area that must be clear of mines or uh, enemy forces uh, for oil to resume. Uh, and so in that area, you could have the, um, the Iranians, if they want to block it, they could do what they've done here, which is on Kish, they put a silkworm and they put uh, a battalion of Marines uh, and they've got a ship and a submarine on the uh, right side of the uh, map. And then near Bandar Abbas to the north, they've got... Uh, three ground units and a silkworm unit on Quesham Island. And so what the U.S. has done here is deployed a special forces unit on um, the silkworm. Um, they, they've landed an airborne unit on Quesham Island. And on the left, you have the three marine units that are being uh, landed on top of uh, Kish Island uh, to take out the silkworm and the, um, and the marine unit there. Uh, what I'm not showing is, is the naval unit that would be necessary to land those three uh, marine units. And on the... Um, on the right of the screen, you see an F-18 attacking a surface unit, an American surface action group um, uh, being adjacent to, but actually on top of a, an Iranian uh, submarine unit. And on top of the um, Bandar Abbas, you can see three American F-22s. Now, the American uh, F-22s have a, in yellow a minus two, and the silkworms have in yellow a minus three on their counters, and they indicate negatives for uh, attack, anti-ground or anti-air attacks conducted against them because silkworms can be easily hidden and F-22 are stealth aircraft, so they're much more difficult to destroy. And you can see the effects of this. Um, the American Marines have damaged both the uh, IRGC Marine uh, Battalion and the silkworm on the island of Kish. The uh, three uh, Iranian units have been uh, damaged and flipped over to their weaker strength side and the Special Forces units attacked the silkworm and weakened it as well and the Iranian... Uh, surface craft, the FAC, fast attack craft, and the uh, submarine have also been damaged. Now, uh, just a word on the uh, ground combat. The ground combat is uh, very, very similar to the um, India-Pakistan simulation. The differences here on this map uh, is that the ground combat can only occur on islands in the Persian Gulf and can only occur underneath, south of the dashed line um, uh, in Iran. Uh, areas north of that are much more uh, uh, heavily defended and uh, infrastructure-wise it would be difficult to penetrate that, that deep into Iran. So there are no red lines here. There are no roads to follow. There's basically free movement. When an attack is conducted, the defender may choose uh, either to retreat or to take a step loss. And if any unit is forced off the map, forced 
um, north across the dashed line, they're permanently out of play. In other words, they've been severely damaged and they're not coming back. So the Americans, if they want to take Bandar Abbas, need only push the units uh, north. Uh, in terms of naval effects, uh, operating on a coastal hex actually gives a plus one bonus, or rather a minus one bonus to the uh, defender against an air attack, because in this inshore operation, they're able to hide uh, using the, the coastal area, where in the Indo-Pakistan game, it was more dangerous to hide in the coast. But here it's easier because the silkworms are there, and so if you're not next to the silkworm, it's actually uh, safer for the naval craft. Now, the important point is, uh, for Iran at least, most of its oil actually comes from provinces that have a minority Persian population. Uh, much of its oil comes from around Abadan, which is a majority, or used to be rather, a majority Arab province. The Arabs call it Arabistan, the Iranians call it Khuzestan. And uh, so there's sort of some policy interest um, that if there was to be an extended conflict with Iran, uh, this just would be a target for conquest because it would... Uh, severely hamper Iran's ability to prosecute war by seizing control of its largest oil-producing areas. So you can see here uh, circles with numbers in them. Uh, there's ones which are um, associated with um, uh, uh, um, uh, oil extraction facilities uh, in the northern part of the Persian Gulf that are controlled by Iran. Um, and then there are twos which are in Khuzestan, and then three which are down the coast from Khuzestan uh, near Karg Island and Boucher. And uh, each of these are associated with victory points um, that are uh, deducted from Iran's total if ever they're seized, typically by airborne or marines. These areas would, would most often be well defended, so it would be quite a fight to secure these locations. Uh, this is Israel. The Israeli setup is fairly simple. Our, all of the aircraft deploy at Ramat David. There are other aircraft, but the long-range aircraft are there. There's the uh, reactor Demona. There are two Arrow anti-missile um, uh, uh, batteries that need to be deployed. Um, the Israelis also have in the Gulf of Aqaba at Ailat a, a submarine with a nuclear and conventional uh, cruise missiles that can deploy to the Arabian Sea to uh, fight um, against, uh, against Iranian targets or fire missiles at Iranian targets. And uh, the Israelis have uh, Jericho missiles um, that can also launch missiles um, at Iran, and they have a special forces unit. So these are some of the land modifiers. Again, they're very similar to the Indo-Pakistan simulation. Uh, if an attacker is attacking into a defending hex and the defending hex contain, uh, is, it contains mountains or a city or the attack is occurring across a river hex side, there are modifiers. Uh, there's a minus one air modifier for aircraft attacking into mountains or cities. Um, if armor is operating in a city or in a mountain, um, there's a, a minus one um, uh, in effect because the... Uh, the, the um, rather a, a plus one in effect because armor is more easily visible in the mountains um, along the roads. So there's, uh, again, a modifier for if the Americans use um, uh, nuclear um, torpedoes or, or use nuclear weapons to chase submarines. Um, when air attacks are conducted, 50% is added to the um, strength of, a, of an accompanying ground attack. Um, unlike the uh, Indo-Pakistan uh, game, Air attacks here can damage ground units but may not destroy them. And even if the unit's already been damaged, they can attack again simply to add that value to a ground attack. Ground units may damage air units by firing surface-to-air missiles. So that's changed. Uh, but it, essentially, the, the dynamics at sea are, are uh, identical to the uh, Indo-Pakistan uh, simulation. All units move uh, one hex per turn, except for U.S. armor, which moves two. All missile units, which are possessed by the Iranians and the Israelis, can move three hexes per turn. Um, SAM units in Iran can move five hexes per turn, as well as the American SAM units in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, now, the, uh, the Israeli submarine takes two turns to go from Ailat uh, down through the Red Sea uh, into the Arabian Sea. Now, when the Israelis are um, bombing Iran, the, the Iranians may activate four target groups. They may activate Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Iraqis, if Iraq, Iraq is overflown. Uh, the number on the left um, uh, in the brackets indicates the number that the Iranians must roll in order to activate. Now, the effects of activation are that many uh, uh, Israeli aircraft are committed to that operation, that particular operation, to stop the uh, firing of missiles into Israel. So if, if Syria were to be activated, which is done on a 2-on-10, then three F-16s would be diverted. If Hezbollah would be activated, 
four on ten, two F-16s would be diverted. If Hamas is activated, it would divert one F-16, and it would require three on ten. And if the Israelis ever overfly Iraq, uh, Iraq has no effect on Israeli aircraft. It doesn't divert any aircraft, but uh, the Americans suffer big negatives because they uh, essentially they lose um, sympathy with the Iraqi people who are uh, upset at the Iraqi government's association with the U.S. while the Israelis are overflying Iraq. Now, special forces conduct and can conduct a number of operations. The Americans have three. The Israelis have one. Some of these are safe. Some of these are dangerous. Um, the ones that are dangerous, if uh, in the attack, after the attack, a D-10 is rolled and a 10 is rolled, then the unit is destroyed. So a special forces unit may uh, deploy onto a hex with a SAM unit, and they have a 50% chance of causing the SAM unit to, to suffer a minus two effectiveness. So they would uh, basically conduct a raid, and that, that SAM unit will be uh, less effective. Uh, they can also, as we saw before, conduct a LERP, a long-range rescue pat patrol, where put into a hex, uh, they're perfectly safe, and they add a plus two to the attack modifier of all aircraft against a particular target. They can conduct a level five attack on an installation, such as an oil refinery or uh, an airbase, and uh, if they succeed uh, f five or less, then the, the installation is destroyed. The airbase is destroyed. But if they roll a 10, the unit's uh, annihilated. Uh, they can conduct a missile raid. Uh, and the effect of a missile raid is to, it has a 50% chance of not allowing the missile unit to fire. So this is important if, the, for example, the Iranians want to fire a rocket uh, with a probable nuclear missile and the Israelis want to be, uh, well, they want to decrease the chance that it's going to operate this turn. Uh, but again, it, there's a, a 1 in 10 chance the unit will be destroyed. Uh, now, the Iranians, when they uh, uh, get their allocation of nuclear weapons at the beginning of the turn, uh, have to uh, pair them up and locate them across the map in specific hexes. They can associate them with ships. They can associate them with missiles. They can put them at air bases. They can put them in the middle of the desert. So the Israelis need to locate the nuclear weapons before they conduct a nuclear weapons raid. A nuclear weapons raid is, is simply moving the um, special forces unit into the hex, and if, if they roll a zero, the unit dies, uh, but they first need to do the reconnaissance uh, the turn before. Now, doing the reconnaissance is automatic. It's, it, here it indicates that it's, the, the unit dies, but it doesn't. It's perfectly safe. The special force unit would uh, be assigned to the hex. Uh, the, the individual running the game, which would typically be me, I would have in the back of my pocket a list of the hexes where the Iranians have nuclear weapons. The Israelis or the Americans would give me their um, nuclear weapons reconnaissance uh, hexes, and I would see if it matches up, and I would tell, then tell the Americans or Israelis what they found there. Now, the uh, Iranians have a choice to do terrorism against NATO, the GCC, or the U.S., and you can see the modifiers there and negatives for both sides uh, for conducting terrorism, although uh, the target suffers a much greater loss in terms of uh, victory points, and the Iranians may conduct terror bombing against GCC cities. Their CSS-8 missiles uh, can be moved uh, within range of places like Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, and they can then bombard uh, the targets. There's a maximum of three missiles that can be uh, used to hit a particular city, or three airstrikes, uh, but bombing against Riyadh is unlimited. So these are the uh, aircraft ranges. Again, the rules here are different than India-Pakistan. Israel has a range of 30 for its F-16s and 35 for its F-15s, but there, and there's a plus 20 hex modifier if they're able to get their tankers in the air. And for that, they need permission, either of Saudi Arabia or Turkey. Um, everyone else has, uh, except the, the um, uh, NATO and the U.S., have a 10 hex range. So that's the Iranians, the Pakistanis, and the GCC. NATO and the U.S. have unlimited range in their aircraft because of uh, in-flight refueling. Uh, interception for Iran is within three hexes of a tab. For the Gulf Cooperation Council, it's 10 hexes because of the Saudi AWACS. Uh, the NATO and U.S. can uh, in intercept any aircraft at any time outside of Iran. Um, now, the SAM value ranges are uh, zero in other words, uh, the, uh, some of the uh, surface-to-air missile systems only operate in their own hexes, and that's the PAC-3 and the SA-11. The number in brackets is the number that, that uh, the player has to roll equal to or less than in order to have an effect and to uh, shoot down uh, an aircraft to basically inflict a step-loss damage. The uh, units with one hex range are the Israeli Arrow, the Chinese HQ-9, the Russian S-300, and all U.S. Uh, warships. Again, the numbers there uh, show the um, values of shooting down aircraft. Uh, you can see the missile ranges at the top. Uh, those pertain to the Israelis um, and the Iranians, the Shahab 3s, and the American uh, ships and submarines. Uh, missile units may, may fire a maximum of three volleys of, of missiles 
uh, every turn, maximum. So you'll have a missile unit, and it's got a number of uh, rockets that, that, that it can fire. It cannot fire more than three. Uh, you can see the different ranges for the Iranian missiles, for the Israeli missiles. Uh, it also specifies in there the number of nuclear weapons uh, for the Israelis. They've got 20 nuclear uh, air bombs, 10 Jericho conventional weapons, uh, two nuclear uh, Jerichos. And essentially, for a conventional missile to hit, you'd have to roll a one on 10, uh, and then you'd have to roll against the modifier of the target. So they're fairly low probability. Even the Israeli missiles are not uh, sufficiently accurate to cause um, a high probability of widespread damage against the target. Uh, you can see the, the Saudis, uh, they've got um, their two, two nuclear CSS-2s if Pakistan is activated by an Iranian or an Israeli uh, nuclear attack. Now, the uh, earlier, um, uh, yeah, so you can, here you can see uh, the BMD, the ballistic missile defenses. Uh, many of those uh, air defense systems also double as interceptors. Uh, so if a missile uh, fires uh, across the map and goes over, uh, the hex is covered by the systems, these can also attempt to shoot down missiles. So if Iranian missiles are fired at Israel, they first have to get through the Israeli arrow system. The American Pac-3 and American ships can also shoot down missiles, the S-300, the HQ-9, and the Europeans have a missile defense system of six, which, which doesn't have an air defense parallel to it. Now, if you look at the nuke functions here, nuclear weapons do not work automatically. Uh, they fail uh, uh, with regularity, depending on the system that's launching them. Uh, the U.S. and NATO, their missiles work 90% of the uh, their rockets for other nuclear weapons detonate 90% of the time. Uh, the other countries have uh, varying uh, levels of efficiency. Now, for uh, substrikes, uh, the Americans have no limit to the number of nuclear weapons they can launch from submarines, but there's a limit of three conventional attacks from each of their submarine units. The Israeli uh, submarine can fire one conventional volley and three nuclear volleys from their uh, cruise missiles. Now, missile suppression happens when an aircraft unit attacks or a special forces unit attacks um, a missile unit, and that missile unit has a 50% chance then of, um, of launching only, and a 50% chance of not launching. Um, and there's rules down there for striking uh, Israel with conventional weapons. Um, so if Israel's Demona was hit, the Iranians would have to hit it twice. Each time it would have to survive um, penetrating the arrow system. Then they would have a 1 in 10 chance of hitting the facility. And then they would have to roll um, uh, considering the defense modifier for, say, Demona or, or Ramat David. So these are the activation rules we talked about earlier for Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas, and overflying by Israel of Iraq. Uh, these are more detailed special forces rules, so whoever is responsible for the special forces in the U.S. or Israel, because these are very, very um, uh, useful units, they should be very familiar with the rules. They're, again, with, as, as, almost identical to the Indo-Pakistan simulation. Uh, the members of the Security Council uh, can attempt to uh, condemn or uh, secure ceasefire resolutions. These are some of the mission cards that are associated with the positions. Uh, these are um, uh, just some of them, a select few. Uh, here I've got the Iranian uh, political mission card. Um, here is the uh, mission card for the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Command. Uh, they're responsible for um, the naval units, the, the uh, acts of terror, the um, uh, nuclear weapons. So they have, they have a lot of the special functions uh, in the game. Uh, these are the Israeli strategic forces that are responsible for the uh, nuclear weapons, such as the Jericho 2 and 3 missiles at Palmaquim uh, Air, Air Base. Uh, they command the Arrow SAMs, and they can, they can uh, uh, move the uh, submarine around, and they deploy the special forces unit. These are the Chinese. Um, they're, they're a single player that plays the full gamut of roles. They're primarily interested with getting oil out of the Persian Gulf from Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, uh, w without without having uh, either destroy the other, because they the China's got strong um, uh, economic influence and uh, a, a significant dependence on oil. Uh, here you can see the GCC political. This is essentially uh, Saudi Arabia and its uh, its Gulf state uh, allies, uh, and it's got you know essentially the different policy instruments available to Saudi Arabia, as well as the penalties for what bad can happen. And this is the. Um, the Monte Carlo I used to determine uh, the victors of a game, the points that a student uh, obtains from the simulation are not compared to other players in the game, but are compared to the same uh, country uh, of, with previous players of previous games. So uh, the American player is judged against uh, the average of all the previous plays by Americans. Now, I should be doing this, as I've mentioned before, uh, by by determining a standard deviation and then comparing um, the 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 
uh, uh, amount of displacement above and below the mean uh, for each player compared to previous players. And that would be a much more uh, reliable way of, of confirming it. But that's, that's sort of a, a project uh, for later on. So uh, an, an essential point I want to make about this simulation is uh, there's often a question why um, the Israelis have not yet attacked Iran. And what this simulation tries to answer is the source of the stability of the status quo. Um, certainly there's a, there's a strong incentive for Israel and Saudi Arabia um, to deal with Iran and for the, uh, the Japanese, the European Union, and Americans to benefit um, from a denuclearized Iran. Uh, but the issues are um, uh, sort of complicated for the Americans because the, 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 the Iranian nuclear weapons, if they were established, and they certainly the Iranians have the option to fire one of their long-range weapons into the heart of Europe, uh, but, you know, the question is, would they want to? Uh, the U.S.'s goal is to maintain general deterrence, particularly in the area of nuclear weapons, which means uh, have, it, um, have it so that most countries do not have it on their agenda thinking about building nuclear weapons, because if there was large-scale proliferation before large-scale democratization, liberal democratization, then the Americans feel their security would be undermined by the nuclear proliferation. So the U.S. would rather have no nuclear weapons detonated. And in fact, countries like Japan, the Europeans, and the Americans have strong negatives for every single nuclear weapon detonated, doesn't matter by whom, because it then um, uh, 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 sends a message out. And the message is nuclear weapons are efficient, they're cost-effective, and they're easy to build. And uh, the U.S. would rather not have a proliferation provoked by a nuclear conflict. So there's a lot of pressure um, to, for countries to resolve uh, high-end disputes like this peacefully. So this is the simulation. Um, for the tactical component, I'd refer the students uh, back to the uh, uh, Indo-Pakistan uh, simulation. But essentially, uh, 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 this does not mean uh, you shouldn't read the rules. The rules have uh, a lot of additional details that are more specific uh, to particular players. And so students should be familiar uh, with the details.